Welcome to The Writing Monkey, a podcast for writers about everything but writing. Subject matter experts and unique individuals are interviewed for writers by a writer. Hello and welcome to The Writing Monkey. This is a weekly podcast for writers about almost everything but writing. I talk to subject matter experts in order to help writers with their creativity. Today we have Cookie Robledo. She is from Houston, Texas, and she's a little person. She was three feet tall but underwent several surgeries and is now an impressive three feet, four and one half inches tall. But that's just the surface. I know it sounds corny, but reading about Cookie, I realized just how true it is that it's what's inside that counts. I can see that she's a giant person in all the ways that really matter. She has accomplished a lot in a short period of time. She's a college graduate with a BA in psychology from Duke University. She was the president of the Duke University Disability Alliance, and she's the director of public relations for the Little People of America, or the LPA. She's also a competitive dancer, and she's been on the hit reality TV show, The Little Couple. Hi, Cookie, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, Luke? So, this podcast is primarily aimed at writers to help them be more creative, but it's also a chance for folks such as yourself to correct misconceptions, air grievances, promote causes, enlighten people, and be included in mainstream fiction and media. With that in mind, first tell me, or tell the audience about yourself, is there anything I left out of your introduction? Um, well, just that, um, in addition to all that, I am the Rudin Wright uh, Storytellers coordinator, which basically I teach people with disabilities how to create their own advocacy videos. So that means I teach them about the pre-production, production, and post-production stages of video production. And, um, but yeah, let's, let's get started. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate you agreeing to be on. You're obviously a special person. I admit, I'll admit at first I was just looking for a little person but the more I spoke to you, the more I read your website, the more impressed I became with how much you've accomplished. And it's, it's amazing. Oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's really nice of you to say. And, um, yeah, no, but I'm very glad that you, uh, you know, approached me and I'm happy to help in whatever way I can. Okay, so tell me, how did you become the Director of Public Relations for the LPA? Oh, yeah, so basically... Um, this was back when, this was, I think, about a, about a year ago. Um, it was, I received an email from uh, the board of directors, and basically there were elections. It was a, a new term was starting to, uh, was beginning, and there was going to be a big switch in the board. And there was an opportunity for this public relations position, and um you know, I just recently started getting involved in LPA. This was, I had been involved in LPA for, at this point, about three years, and I wanted to be involved more. I wanted to kind of get to know more about the people, and, um, you know, and so I thought the best way was to try to, um, you know, get involved on the board level. And specifically, the reason why I decided to run for uh, the PR position was, because there was like a lot of communicating with not just people, you know, inside the organization, but a lot of networking that goes on um, outside of the organization. I think that's really important when it comes to um, when it comes to expanding and kind of sharing what Little People of America is about to the world. And so I basically talk with different media companies and uh, different publications, and just to kind of, you know, if they have any questions about uh, LPA, I'm kind of the first point of contact to just kind of, you know, give them a little bit about who we are, and then if there are any like, interview opportunities, I'm usually uh, one or a few. There's also the president who also um, partakes in some interviews, but basically they ask, uh, I get asked to um, potentially do interviews and to talk a little bit about meeting of Little People of America and how, you know, and talk about different issues that um, revolve about, around the dwarfism community. And so I've enjoyed it. It's definitely been a big learning experience. I think I'm the 
youngest person on the board. So it's definitely a learning experience for me, but I've met a lot of great people in the process, and everyone on the board is fantastic. And I've gotten to really know and learn more about the issues, you know, that surround the dwarfism community today. That's amazing. So speaking of uh, dwarfism, would you mind telling me about the various forms of dwarfism and your type specifically? Yes, yes, absolutely. So those, oh boy, so those over like 500 different types of dwarfism. So the most common form of dwarfism is achondroplasia, and um, it's the most common. And then um, the type of dwarfism I have specifically is called spondyloepimetaphyseal dysplasia, but I just say it's basically SEMD for short. And, I mean, all types of dwarfism, there's a variation of, you know, short stature. Um, my type specifically is, um, you know, I'm a little bit more, I always tell people that when they look at me, just think of, like, shrinking down an average-sized person because everything about me is a little bit more, uh, proportional in some degree, and then uh, people with achondroplasia, they have a more average sized torso and then shorter limbs and a little bigger head, and then those people who have diastrophic dysplasia that um, have smaller hands, and you know, it really, really, you know, just varies. There's so many different forms of dwarfism, uh, and what's interesting is that, you know, we have different commonalities. Uh, less we have some commonalities in terms of, you know, experiences in day to day life. Like, you know, how how is it to be someone with dwarfism or a little person? And you know, how we go through, you know, society and you know, different social issues. Like a lot of that is very similar, but some of the stuff that we talk deal with medically is a little bit different too, depending on our type of uh, dwarfism or skeletal dysplasia. So. I mean, I could go on and on and talk about uh, right. the different forms, but um, but yeah, no, there are just many forms, and uh, but you know, at the same time, it's what's nice about this organization is that Little People of America is that you know we can come together, talk about these issues, and we have kind of sense of camaraderie over the different issues. But at the same time, we celebrate our differences because there's so many differences within the dwarfism community. Right. I know my audience is supposed to be writers. I would encourage them to include little people and a more vari variety of characters into their fiction because I believe it makes it more interesting. But it also, you know, it's more inclusive. But I would encourage them to learn about the different forms of dwarfism and the different vocabulary, the different words and terms, and I'll touch on that more later. But talking about dwarfism, I read that your form of dwarfism doesn't affect your intelligence or your life expectancy, but you mentioned in your website that you might need to have your spine fused at a later date, and I was wondering what that meant, what that means for you and what that yeah, actually means. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so right now I've had uh, two spine surgeries in my life. Um, originally, I developed a 100-degree uh, curvature in my spine, a form of scoliosis. And so when I was 11 years old, I had to get that, um, I had to get that fixed and corrected. So I actually had this new growing rod in place back in 2007 where, um, and this was only done in Paris, France at the time. They had nothing like this in the United States. And basically, the rod, I was able to, you know, continue growing without having to go in surgically every three or six months to expand the rod. It was just using a big block that was like a magnet, and just my mom would turn it or, like, twist it, like, over my back, and you could hear, like, the chamber clicking. And so my spine would continue growing without having to go in to have more surgeries. And then I had to get that rod replaced with a regular static rod, so... Um, yeah, so basically what, you know, most, uh, at some point, I think most little people have, uh, their spine cues, and that usually is a result of, you know, sometimes there's complications with, you know, the current law that we have. So right now what I'm just, what we're trying to watch is to see and make sure that the spine is, 
you know, stable. Like right now it is pretty stable and um and the rod hasn't become disconnected. Um, you know, there is a chance that in the future, uh, when the spine is fused, you know, basically that, and I think at this point I'm done growing, but basically that means that, um, the, I, I feel like my mobility would be, um, a little bit less once I have my spine fused, um, cause all my joints will get, uh, more compressed and it'll, the fusion will help in the long run to, you know, prevent my spine from actually like going back to its original form of my scoliosis. Uh, so basically the fusion would basically stabilize my spine without having to have any metal, uh, rod kind of in place there. The only issue is what I mentioned before is that I would kind of, uh, lose some of my um, flexibility and mobility. So we're hoping that, you know, if we just kind of watch and, like, you know, if I take care of my body really well, that fusion maybe, uh, spine fusion maybe won't have to ha- happen. Um, but I do have to prepare later on, maybe as I get older, maybe in my 30s or hopefully later, that I might have to have that. But you're still hoping that maybe I won't have to have that in the future. Yeah, and medicine and science keeps getting better exponentially. And, you know, I've had my share of broken bones and surgeries over the last few years, so I know a taste of what you've gone through a little bit. And um, I was amazed. I've had surgery recently that a few years ago would have involved opening up half my body, and it would have taken me months to recover. But using the robotic surgery, they were able to go in there with these little rods, and I was walking around like a day later. You know, yeah, no, so. it, it's incredible. Yeah, after my second spine surgery, I was, they had me up and walking three days after. So it's, it's amazing. amazing how, you know, how now technology is a lot less invasive. So, you know, who knows, maybe in the future, if I have to have another spine sur- surgery, it won't be as severe as a spine fusion, but we'll see. Maybe they'll just put a robotic spine in you. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah, they're getting being, they're able to three D print things and and build things so small now it's incredible. Exactly. But you know, I'm going to keep talking about mentioning your website. I spent a lot of time reading it. It was pretty incredible. It's really well developed. You're a great writer, and um, oh, you have pictures you. and you've documented your surgeries. It's it's. Uh, I'm definitely going to have links on my uh, show page to your website and various sources. Oh, great! Thank you. Lots of pictures of you. Really cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, videos of you dancing, which are awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So you talk about your childhood, and I was wondering if you would share with us when you first realized you were different, who talked to you about it, how you handled it, how was your reaction to that? Yeah, and so I think I was around six years old when I realized that I was definitely different than any anyone. Um, I had gone from like a very small church school from preschool and, and kindergarten to then a really big elementary school where the class size was like about 20 people and like I noticed people or the kids would like start kind of pointing and staring and making fun of me and calling me uh, words like baby and you know asking me questions like can you read can you ride how come you can walk and talk so you know then I realized, because I never had gotten asked these questions before, so then I asked my mom, and then my mom taught me how to kind of defend myself and just kind of tell like, how to approach uh, kids or later on, like, adults, uh, if they started asking these questions. And so basically my response would be, you know, well, God made me this way, or, oh, just my bones go out of slow rate the most, but I can do everything that... Uh, that you can. And then I remember there was this one time when I was seven and I was on the playground with my friends minding my own business and there were these kids on the, you know, um, that wanted to get up on the play set and they were heckling me and saying, you can't be up there, you're just a baby. And I was furious at this point. And so I got up and I yelled at them and I said, you listen here. 
You can't tell me what to do. I have every right to be on this equipment as much as you should so just back off. And um, they listened. And they were actually turning to each other. And one of them said, oh, you shouldn't have said anything. And um, then they left me alone. And like I said, I that's kind of one example of when I really like felt I truly advocated for myself. Um, and you know those times that I felt, you know, discouraged because I thought, oh, you know, can I just catch a break? People keep making fun of me. But I just, what's important is that when I surround myself with, like, the right people, the people that, uh, that do matter, because all my friends, they never, you know, make any issues or judgments about me. And I, you know, I feel like I'm just like everyone else when I'm with them and my family. They don't treat me any different. And so it's a matter of just me finding the people that make me feel good and, you know, we all, my mom and I, we have this saying that uh, if there's someone that maybe isn't exactly, like, the most polite person, to put it nicely, we would say, we wouldn't invite that person over to dinner, now, would we? So, um, so you know, in life, I've had, you know, bullies and people te- teasing me because I was different. Uh, but I think, you know, in the end, I developed a pretty thick skin and, like I said, I've had my bad days too, um, but, you know, I think everything has made me a lot stronger, and just as long as I surround myself with the people that love me the most, you know, that's all that really matters. Is yeah. Well, you know what they the say, people. what doesn't kill you, make you makes you feel terrible about yourself. I'm just right. Joking. No, it doesn't kill you, it does make you stronger. And, exactly. Um, you know... It, it, Hey, this sounds corny, but the more I read your website and the more I read about you, uh, the thought that just kept coming to mind is you're a big person. You're a big person. And I know that sounds crazy. I don't know if it sounds pandering or condescending. It doesn't mean to be, but that that's the thought that kept coming to me is there's so many people out there, regardless of their height, that are just small people, you know, fearful or hateful or very small-minded, limited. You're a big person. And um, that just kept coming across to me. And I hope you don't mind me saying that. I hope it doesn't make you feel anything but good. No, no, no. That, that does feel feel good. You know, it's it's interesting that you say say that because it's it's interesting because like when I'm with like people that that really care about me for who I am, you know, I kind of I forget about my size, and it's just nice to you know you know feel like oh I'm just you know it's nice to feel like that that I can be bigger than you know what i than what my science is and exactly. yeah no and it's interesting that you say that because um part of the work that i do um is uh is very disability related and one of the things that i try not to do is um because what comes with the territory of my work is there are a lot of people that can be really bitter about you know life and circumstances and I try really hard to steer away from trying to be bitter and angry because that's just not a person, that's just not who I am. And so it reminds me that about being around the people and kind of reflecting on my life and realizing that I, you know, had a lot going, I have a lot going for me and, you know, I had a lot of struggles go, going up, but, um, you know, in the end, um, you know, life is life. You live life once, so you you need to make the most of it. That's what I tell myself. So, um, so I'm say thank you for saying that that you think I'm like this big person because I want to feel like and be like that big person. Well, you know what I mean, yeah. And I know because you um you mentioned on your website you uh, were hesitant to get your bone go through the surgery to have your bones lengthened because you didn't want to give up your identity as a little person. Yes, 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 yes. No, yeah, that's, yeah, no, so that's, um, that's one thing that's interesting about the, um, the Little People of America community is there was, uh, kind of two sides to, uh, the bone lengthening issue. Like, there's one side that's very against it, that, you know, we're born the way we are, we should embrace, have pride, you know, in our bodies, and then there are other people that, that, feel like I need this surgery, I want to be um, like everyone else, I want to 
you know, have the height and be like everyone else. Um, the way I looked at it when I was trying to make my decision, and most people when they have this bone lengthening surgery, uh, they usually do it in like three rounds. So they usually start when they're really young, like six years old. Then maybe another time when they're like middle in middle school, and then another time like towards the end of high school. So you know, throughout the process, you can probably gain almost as much as like 16 inches in height at the end. Yeah, but so and this kind of goes back to you know the different forms of dwarfism. Uh, Since my form of dwarfism is a lot, I'm a lot smaller than someone who has a chondroplasia. I already knew that no matter what, I was always going to be small. And I knew that if I gained any more height, I was going to look like someone on stilts. And that yeah. wasn't me. Yeah. And that wasn't me. Um, part of the reason I wanted to get um, this surgery was I wanted to be able to drive. And so I'm not saying that um, this surgery, you have to get the surgery in order to be able to drive. Because there's you know, so many ways nowadays with technology that you can drive um, without having the uh, limb lengthening surgery. But for me, um, I wanted to be able to use pedal extensions and one of my good friends and idol, uh, Jen Arnold from The Little Couple, I, you know, I wanted to be, you know, like her. And so I thought, well, if she's able to drive, I just need to get around the same height as her, like in terms of like from the inseam to my, to the bottom of my foot. And, you know, then I'm golden. So that was one of the main reasons I had the surgery. And, you know, another reason, too, was you know, I was going off to college very soon. And I wanted to be able to, you know, just reach counters a little bit easier, reach tables easier. And um, it actually did make quite a difference. My uh, momentum when I walk is significantly better because of it. Uh, so I can walk a little bit longer distances. Um, and I felt more independent once I went off to college after I had the surgery because, you know, it just helped me reach things a little bit easier. And, um, then if I, you know, if I didn't have it and then, you know, now I recently got my driver's license. I now have a car that's getting modified. So, you know, it all, you know, this was done like five years ago. And so it all comes in full circle. So now looking back. It was really difficult. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was not not easy. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There were moments where my mom and I would be crying. And we, I would kept thinking, is this worth it? It was just a lot of pain. It was, I had to do physical therapy an hour every day. And, um, you know, it's hard when you have a bunch of hardware kind of attached to your legs. And it's like total was like four pounds of weight on my legs. It's like almost... Yeah almost a quarter of my weight. So, um, uh, but, you know, looking back now, you know, I feel really good. Like, I feel more confident. I feel, you know, my momentum in walking, I feel is a lot better. And yeah. I can feel like I can do more things because of it. And But at the same time, I knew I was always going to be small, and I was okay with that because, you know, I don't think I would be me if I was anyone else or if I was any taller. But all of that ad- adversity and challenge has really fueled your greatness. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we talked about some of the bad times, you know, some of the challenges and the hardships. But overall, have people treated you fairly nicely and decently for most of your life, your experience? Yeah, I, I think I would say that you know, with the exception of kids who they're ignorant and um, sometimes and they don't know how to, like, approach me or, you know, they, you know, the staring and the pointing and with the occasional, like, adult who maybe doesn't know how to respond. Other than that, once I got out of elementary school, it's interesting, a lot of people mentioned that bullying gets worse in high school. I actually it got better for me once I left elementary school because I was surrounded by people who, you know, same age as me, who were open-minded. And then obviously going off to college, and that really helped because people, you know, at least like for me, they were pretty open-minded with who I who I was. And so I thought, you know, I think I guess I could say I was pretty lucky with the people that have been in my life. That That's I've great to hear. Had, 
yeah, that I've had a great support system. And I think it just comes with trying to surround yourself with the people who who matter, who matter to you. From everything I've read, it sounds like you have an incredible mom who really helped you a lot and helped frame your mindset and get you into places where you would have a better experience than not. Exactly. No, that's one thing that I love about my mom is that she really uh, pushes me. She like, wants me to get outside of my comfort zone and pushes me to, um, you know, to do what I need to do and what I want to do. Like, she doesn't want to see me pity and wallow in myself. And um, and no matter, like, how difficult the times were, when there were times that I almost wanted to do, that she just kind of pushed me and said, nope, you can't wallow. You got to keep going. You got to keep go- going. And, you know, because of that... You know, now I have all these opportunities in front, in front of me. Like, I, you know, wanted to apply to, you know, Duke University because she went there and I felt uh, she, um, kind of knowing that she went there was like a really nice presence and like kind of safety for me. But, um, you know, it was also intimidating too because it was my first time living away from home. And, you know, my mom said, okay, well, you know what? You can either go have a great adventure or you can stay in the house and go to um a community college or something and then I realized no I, I need to I need to do this and so it's just kind of her pushing me to get to where I need to be and always like cheerleading me and you know she's always always telling me that she's on my team and you know I wouldn't have any other team player on my team um you know than her because she's amazing strong woman who you know i don't know what i would do without without her that's incredible so uh, i was going to ask you shifting gears from the challenges and the negative things that might have happened are there any humorous or funny stories that may have happened to you due to your short stature do you have a good sense of humor about it once someone gets to know you Hmm. and no is is an okay answer remember there's one time at this uh, I went to a conference in DC for for work and I was more making fun of myself just to kind of get the audience to laugh at one of my uh my presentations so part of like I said part of what I do is I you know teach people with disabilities how to make their own advocacy videos and part of the, the videos that we make are you know really short so part of what my team and I were pitching was the importance of making videos for social media that are very short and so then I said, um, well, and, you know, it makes sense because good things come in short sizes or short packages. And then um, people laugh. And, then, or, and, um, and I said, oh, I just got it because then I make it to seem like, oh, yeah, and that also refers to me. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, that's, for some reason that's the only thing I can really think of. No, but there's some things that, like, I do joke about, like, you know, about my size, because, you know, you have to make light of yeah. of the situation. You know, you can't really get super, super deep into the wallowing and the pity, because otherwise then you're just going to get stuck there. So, yeah. so if, if it's things like that that can make people laugh, um, or, like, especially, like, you know, uh, just kind of pointing out the obvious, like, if I'm giving a presentation, like, and yes, I am very short. Um, then it kind of breaks the ice a little bit because it's like, well, once I state the obvious, then it's kind of like, well, once I state the, the elephant in the room, then, you know, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. Well, that's really nice. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Yeah. So, um, on your website, there's a film starring you breaking out. It's uh, entitled Breaking Out. And I have to say, oh. my wife and I have been in film production for 30 years and my wife actually does it professionally and I help her a lot with it. Oh, and, really? um, that film's very well done. And I was wondering if you could tell me more about the production and how that all came to be. Actually, that was done two years ago. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of the Easter Seal uh, Disability Film Challenge. Um, but so that was basically, it's a 48-hour film challenge. It happens over one weekend where we have to produce a short film and there has to be at least one person on on like the team uh, the production team that has a disability are either working um, on camera behind the scenes or like or off camera like behind the scenes or on camera as like 
you know, acting. And that was the first year that I did it, and I was a junior in college, and I asked my friend who uh, was filming, she filmed it, directed it, wrote, and wrote, wrote it. Her name, her name is Kara O'Malley, and um, I asked her, hey, do you want to do the film challenge with me? And so it was really just a two- or three-person team. And, you know, we had no idea how it was going to turn out, but basically what happens is the very first day at, like, a certain time, we get, like, the theme of the film that we have to do, like, a few or like, different themes. We have, like, the motif. Um, we have a list of props that we have to use, and all this has to be done in 48 hours. So I think that year, it was, like, I think the theme was, like, a like a mystery, and um, the kind of the motif that we had to do was, um, like, something, uh, like, trying to escape from from something, something that has, that has to do with action. And so my friend, she wrote and directed the whole thing and so edited it. I just started in it, and it was a lot of fun. It was, I mean, it was my first one, and I, it was, I don't know, it was just a fun experience because most, uh, what's nice about this challenge is that it gives people with disabilities the opportunity to actually, you know, work in production, whether on camera or off camera, and it kind of gives us all the narrative, and we can be represented how we want to be represented. And so uh, that was the first time I did the challenge, and then I did the challenge last year, and I recently did the challenge again um, this year, too. So I've done it wow. three times now, and uh, really it's neat. it's been a lot of fun. Well, that film was really well done. I enjoyed watching it. And like I said, I'm going to I'm gonna have uh, links to your website and all these resources that I mentioned in the podcast. So really, that film actually hits on a topic I wanted to discuss. You know, as writers, we're always asking, what if? What if this? What if that? What if uh, the dead came alive and there were zombies? What if people were magic? That kind of thing. That's one thing I want to encourage writers to do is ask, what if you were a little person? And in your film, that was really interesting. You were a little person locked in a room and you had to think of a way to get out. And I was yeah. wondering if you've been in a situation like in the film where you, your short stature may have caused you a challenge that you had to overcome. I mean, I know as a little kid climbing around in my family's house, I was home alone. I got trapped behind a dresser upside down and I couldn't get out. And I was panicked. And I was like seven years old and I was there for like maybe 30 minutes to an hour, but it felt like forever as a little kid. So I was right. wondering if you have any situations like that you can share with the audience. I remember there was this one time... Uh, when I was younger, and um, and for me, I think it's more of like a fear of being left behind because I'm so small. So I remember there was just this one time I was doing like this test taking thing in a different classroom with a bunch of other kids. You know, we were done, and you know, we were on these like big kind of bar stools, and you know, I'm small, I can't get down. If I get down, I'm gonna hurt myself. So I usually need someone to help like lift lift me up and take me down. And I remembered. Like, the teacher just suddenly, she had all the kids, and then they all just left. And they left me in the dark room. And, yeah, it, it was kind of like what you said. It felt like forever, but it was probably, like, five or ten min minutes until someone came rushing back, all embarrassed and flustered. But, you know, I, ever since then, I guess I've had this kind of fear of being left behind, whether it be, like, physically, like, walking, and I don't want to be left behind by my peers, or, which is why I have my motorized scooter to help me, or not being forgotten in different situations. So, I don't know now, if that answered your question a little bit. No, it does, but it does a lot, actually. Now we have cell phones, so if you have a cell phone, you can communicate to the outside world. Exactly. And the cell yeah, phones have really kind of messed things up for writers in some ways, because... You know, a few years ago, a decade ago, people didn't have cell phones, so it was much easier to trap them in a situation they had to get out of. So exactly. being on this, on these stools, what would you have done if nobody came back? How would you have gotten away? Would you have gone oh. onto the table, tried to lower yourself down? Oh, dear. Yeah, I mean, probably it's what I would have done. I probably would have just, like, just kind of prayed and slowly to just kind of drop myself and just hope that, you know, it doesn't you know, happen. I think maybe that's part of, part of why I'm, like, so um, into trying to control different situations and, like, always trying to be super prepared for, like, the inevitable, just, like, so I have, like, multiple stools on me just in case and, um, 
I mean, actually, now looking back, probably what I should have done, though, is I should have been more vocal instead yeah. of, you know, I should have been more vocal instead of just kind of waiting for someone to come get get me. So yeah. I think, yeah, and I think well, now, maybe if I was in that situation now, like probably before they were going to leave, I probably would have been more like, excuse me, excuse me, can you help me? So I've yeah. gotten a lot better over the years of asking for help. Um, just because of my experience, because it's better to speak up about, you know, situations like this than kind of expect people to, you know, react or do something. So, yeah, I think looking back, I should have been a little bit more vocal about that. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask, has there been a situation where your short stature has been a clear advantage? What comes to mind to me is um, airline travel. I'm not very tall, so it's usually more comfortable for me to sit in a airline seat than it is for a guy who's, you know, six foot five crammed well, into a seat. Yeah. Well, that is true. Like I can probably sit in the middle seat. Um, I have, I've sat in the middle seat between like two bigger people and I've been totally fine because I still have enough space for me. So, um, yeah, no, that's true. And yeah, in terms of, I guess my size, um, I guess, and I know this might sound contradic- contradicting to what I was said earlier, but you know, you know that fear of like being forgotten or left behind because of like physically keeping up with people. But then at the same time, because I'm small, you know, I'm physically like different than everyone around me. So then, if people do remember me, then they do remember me. So. Like, yeah, you're, yeah, you mentioned um, yeah. that. You're very memorable. Nobody forgets who you are. Yeah, so like when I was in, at school, um, back in college, you know, in my class size was like around 1,700 and the university is like around 6,000. And there would be people that would remember me and say, oh, hey, Cookie, hey, Cookie. So it was always nice that, you know, I did have something to have people, you know, remember me by. And it was always usually in a very, like, in a very positive way. So that's always been good as well. I, I think for a while, my, um, what was it, at restaurants also trying to, you know, get the price down if you were, like, under a certain age, trying to fudge that a little bit, I guess. But, um, but yeah, and you know what's interesting, though, um, is once I turned, you know, 21, I had this expectation was like, oh, I'm going to probably have to get carded, you know, everywhere because I'm so small. I look like a kid. But on the opposite side, I actually have not gotten as carded as much as I thought I would. And I think part of it is that I think people are afraid of, um, of like, offending me, of, like, yeah. asking kind of, like, how old are you type of thing. So they just kind of, like, assumed that, okay, she knows what she's doing. I'm not going to ask, here's your, here's your drink. But they're always, like, very nice about, about it. So it's very interesting. And it depends on the person. But I've just noticed a lot uh, recently that um, that I haven't gotten caught in. And I think part of it is that maybe I think people are more open-minded and they don't want to assume, uh, you know, the worst. If I did get caught in, I would totally understand because that is part of the process. But I just, I find it interesting too, you know, that I think uh, uh, that people don't want to make that assumption, which is good. Yeah, that's that's a big reason I'm doing this podcast is I was raised in New Orleans, in, in, which was a, you know, very multicultural, diverse city. And I was raised by a mom and a dad and I was who encouraged me to embrace people's differences and to talk to people. So uh, part of why I'm doing this podcast is um, because people more and more nowadays don't want to have these awkward conversations. And it can be very awkward to ask somebody about their height or their race or their profession or their former profession or their addiction or whatever. But I feel like uh, I want to do it because it helps writers a lot, but it really helps people like you who are different, who don't want to be ignored. They don't want to be gawked at. They want to be talked to. And a lot of people have a hard time just breaking through that initial awkward introduction of, hey, do you mind if I ask about your height? You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's fine. It's fine if, like, for one thing, for people to ask, hey, just how come you're 
so small. Because if you're curious, it's one thing to be curious and want to know the an answer, and that's fine. It's kind of another thing to automatically make assumptions and like start making fun of and mocking and gaw gawking at that. Well, then they come to a different level. Obviously. Genuine curiosity is a form of respect to me. It's a form of acknowledgement. And I'm, I say this in every podcast. People may feel really awkward when I start talking to them. When I'm finished talking to them, they really appreciate the fact that I'm giving them a chance to correct misconceptions and to uh, enlighten people and to and for people to be included in fiction and media. And because what writers will do is either ignore little people or people with differences or they write horribly cliched material they, you know, because they don't want to have the awkward conversation with someone or maybe spend the time reading about Yeah, exactly. Like not doing the research or actually, you know, getting the chance to talk to someone who's a little per person, getting like actual background knowledge. And yeah, and it adds a lot of yeah. it adds a lot of depth to your writing when you're able to use the the right um vocabulary or understand things that only a real person in that situation may understand you know there's a whole lot of information uh customs traditions vocabulary words i was going to ask you about what what would be some of the more offensive portrayals of little people you've seen in the media i know there's older material but it, what are some of the more things that offend you when you see little people represented in the media yeah because yeah the more like the older stuff like the um like the Oompa Loompas and like Wizards and all that stuff like in the past. I kind of think recently, three billboards outside of Evan, Missouri, they had famous actor P.O. Dinklage. There was this one, someone wrote actually specifically to me and they said that um, they went to see the movie and Peter Dinklage played someone who was, who was like went on a date with someone who's an advertised woman. And I think in the theater, uh, there were people laughing and laughing at the fact that that was even happening. And uh, the woman who wrote to me was really upset just kind of about that. So, you know, I think it's a matter of like, if you're looking at media in terms of like the relationship between someone who's a little person and someone who's average height, um, you know, not to really like gawk or make fun of that because, you know, that can happen and you know i think it should be more um that should be talked about a lot more and then i think another thing to like in the media that you know that's interesting that you know i personally don't really like but um and this is a like kind of a controversial subject but there have been like a lot of publications about um and like media talking about like uh midget wrestling yeah. and yeah, and basically, you know, ultimately it is up to the little person themselves if they want to, you know, go into that career and, you know, do it. But it's more of, you know, the way that the publications are writing about it, that it's very, it's very demeaning. And, um, you know, I, I just personally don't know if that should necessarily be I think the media should look at it in a completely di different light and I think there should be both perspectives out there um yeah and so that's a really big issue too that you know the that's what I was talking about the um the when you demean somebody like that midget wrestling midget bowling th that's very demeaning I was curious about because I could see some points of view like um Oompa Loompas are characters and even the Ewoks, those are characters that they got a lot of small people, little people to play. Children are little people, I think. And yeah. So you consider that offensive, the Oompa Loompas? I think it has to do more with the fact that there's this presumption of little people can only play these fictitious characters. Okay. Like, I think one thing that I think Peter Dinklage has done pretty well is that he's played a variety of characters and, you know, there have been, you know, some characters that he's just, you know, a regular human being. Um, but I think there needs to be more awareness for, like, the roles. Like, I think there needs to be more opening for people with 
people with disabilities and little people to play. Right. Just a person. Well, a people like you and Peter Dinklage and Zach Roloff are really special. They've transcended their height. So that Peter Dinklage is an incredible actor. He's someone who can play a different part despite the fact he's a little person, whereas some people may not have the talent and they may be limited to their physical makeup, whether it's the color of their skin or the size of their body, you know. Exactly. And I know Oompa Loompas may not be offensive. It's really what people have the way people use that term that probably is more offensive. And I'm dwelling on it because the one point I was going to make is I know it's equally might be as offensive if they needed a little person in a part, but they use computer technology to, to make that person small, like they did the Hobbits and the Lord of the Rings and things like that. Some people may think, well, that's that offensive. Why wouldn't you just let a little person play that part instead of hiring a big person and making them look small? Yeah, no, it's definitely... That is also a very, very good point. Yeah, I think with that, I think it also goes back to kind of a bigger issue on media representation where, you know, how come if someone's playing someone with a, who has a uh, amputated arm or something, and instead of like using like the computer to like kind of, and Photoshop to eliminate the arm of someone, you know, who has it, why not actually get someone who, has was actually an amputee, and um, and I think that does go that is similar to you know what you were saying that allowing um, and I think it's like I said it goes to the real person who wants to go to these roles because you know ultimately that's their decision it's how they're getting paid if they want to do that that's totally fine I think there does need to be a little bit more. I think openings for um, you know those opportunities. So like if there is a role specifically for a little person, yeah, then definitely make that casting call uh, for the LP community. Um, I do think though that there can be a greater push though for casting calls for people of all abilities, so that little people can you know potentially get roles as you know just a person and um so I, I don't know that that's hopefully something that's going to in hindsight later on get better just kind of with more awareness and people being a little bit more open-minded nowadays um yeah. so but it's, it's definitely a, a, it's definitely a an issue that has gotten better, but I think it needs to still be worked yeah. on a lot more. Yeah, I find That's it incredibly sure. interesting. I really do. So switching gears a little bit here, what mistakes would you encourage writers to avoid? Is there terminology or assumptions that are made about little people that you would encourage writers to avoid? Or have we covered that fairly well already? Um, well, in terms of, um, of like terminology, definitely don't use the word midget even if you don't intend of it being derogatory, just because in its nature, unfortunately, you know, it is like uh, people who do tend to use the word mid midget, they use it as like a form of de uh, uh, being derogatory and is like actually being mean and cruel. And it just goes back to an era that um, dealt with people being, little people being ridiculed and like, performances and right. uh and circuses so that's definitely one that's definitely not um little person is okay um an lp is okay um l people also prefer um don't mind using using the word uh dwarf um obviously though you know we do prefer to you know be called by our names but well, so maybe yeah. what i would encourage writers yeah, so probably what I would encourage writers is you can preface in whatever book that you're writing that this person is, you know, a little person, but then further on in the story, just kind of refer them by, you know, right. their name, if if, po if possible. Because it, it is important to give context in a story. I definitely do understand that as being working in a field that deals with a lot of storytelling, it's just a matter of making sure that it doesn't become like, 
the whole exactly. identity of that person. That this person has a name, has a personality. So make sure that that definitely comes through too, and it's not almost like like um, like kind of a, a thing, a being, a creature. Exactly. If, you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess there is a balance though, because as a fiction writer. If you're six feet tall, you're writing about someone who's three feet tall. It's hard to remember that, and it's hard. It's hard as you're writing, not to just write the character like they're six feet tall and everything is easy, and you step over ditches and open doors and run upstairs and shoot shotguns. And when you're three feet tall, all of that's different. All of that takes more time. Could be more dangerous, you know, things like that. Yeah, we're getting close to the end here. And uh, again, I want to thank you. I'm going to make sure that people have all the links and information they can on you and your causes. And I was going to ask you if there's a source that you would point a writer to if they wanted to include a little person in their fiction. Are there books or sources you would point them to? So there's one book by um, Matt Roloff, um, of Zach Roloff's father, who um, uh, he that he wrote. I can't remember the, um, the name off the top of my head, but I can. Uh, I can send you the the link to that. And then there's uh, both my friends from the little couple. They both wrote uh, two books. One of them, one of the books is kind of about their life and their journey. And then the other book is kind of like a uh, a motivational book on like how to like think big for yourself. So regardless if you're like small in stature or if you're a regular uh, average height per- person, it's more how they use this philosophy of think big. And they um, and they kind of uh, they, they think big kind of spells a big uh, a bigger picture, like a bigger ac- acronym for it. And um, they use examples from you know their life on how they you know in their life were able to think big. So those, I recommend those two books for sure. Um, the LPA website that we have also has some good resources. It's LPA online, you know, dot, or, dot org. We have a lot of good resources, especially more like on like the, you know, research medical side. And that also has like a big list of, um, books too that people can, um, can look at or research if they want more information as well. Yeah, and like I said, your website alone is very, very informative and enjoyable. I really enjoyed it. I, sp- I spent probably a couple hours reading over your website, watching the videos, following the links. Oh, that's good. No, I'm glad. No, I, I, I created that website a little over a year ago for web design class, so I'm glad that it's found like really good use. So thank you. Yeah, it's really well done. So I wanted to thank you again for your time and your patience and answering my questions. And I hope we stay in touch. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me be on your podcast. And I'm glad I could help, you know, future writers and with storytelling. You know, I'm always a big advocate for storytelling. And hopefully this will open doors, you know, for more representation of little people in the media and in stories with a better accurate representation. So, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Well, thank you and bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Writing Monkey podcast. Be sure to visit us online to access our comprehensive show notes and bonus content. Until next time, write you monkey.